So as uh, Professor Jaka said, uh, we, our institute is placed inside the synchrotron. This is a synchrotron, is a, this is a free electron laser, and this is uh, the former task, now YOM. And uh, our lab is uh, here, and we can claim that our lab is uh, the nearest lab uh, to the border with Slovenia. So, uh, but we will move probably this year in this building. Now, here was the, is the CBM, Mensa, and so on, just to know where we are located. <clears throat> so the outline of my talk uh, is as follows. Um, I will speak about, I will try to explain very shortly what is optical manipulation. Then I will uh, uh, give some examples about uh, local stimulation and probing uh, of sing in single cell experiments using optical manipulation. And uh, then I will focus more on uh, focal cell biochemical stimulation using optically manipulated microvectors. And among these vectors, I will present an example using uh, surface coated beads, another example uh, using biodegradable microsources, and still another example, lipid vesicles. So the motto of the presentation I like uh, to, I usually use a, a motto for each presentation. I think this one fits pretty well. The progress in science depends on the new techniques, new discoveries, and new ideas, probably in that order. Uh, Brenner uh, is a Nobel Prize uh, honor in medicine, if I'm not wrong, 2002 or 2003. And I am happy that a me uh, medical doctor says this. So uh, what is optical manipulation? By optical manipulation, we mean the use of laser beams in optical microscopy to trap, to move, or to ablate objects with size ranging from 100 nanometer to 100 micrometer. So this is uh, what I mean, what we mean by optical manipulation. Um, which tools are used for optical manipulation? Like in surgery, we use tweezers and we use scalpels. But these tweezers and scalpels are based on the light. So they do not get in contact, mechanical contact, with the particles that are manipulated. Okay, so this is the, the main difference, let us say. Um, what is an optical tweezers? An optical tweezers is a tweezers based on a laser beam focused through an objective microscope. The condition is to have an objective microscope with high numerical aperture, which is good because this allows us also to observe the sample with a good resolution, spatial resolution. So in the focal plane of the objective, if we have particles in a sample cell in fluid, the particle is trapped in 3D in the focus. If we want to move this particle, we have to tilt the laser beam, which can be implemented relatively simple. So we can trap, and then we can manipulate the particle, as you see in this movie a particle trapped and moved in 2D, you know, in one direction, then in another direction, and then you will see, because it's not in focus, the third direction, the optical axis, the zeta here, okay? So the idea is to manipulate what you see, but also to see what you manipulate. No? And this is possible because you can fit the laser tweezers into the microscope, very simply. Here is an example with uh, another type of particles, let us say, with erythrocytes. No? And you see the erythrocyte is trapped, and it is trapped and then rotated with a disc with a longer size along the optical axis. And then you move the sample, but this stay fixed. So you can uh, change the relative position of this cell to the other cells. So who invented the optical tweezers? This is Arthur Ashkin. 
a fantastic researcher. I have to say I want to spend two words about him because he would deserve, not in my opinion, in, in the community opinion, the Nobel Prize. He, he didn't uh, got it. Uh, but uh, also he, he, what, what is amazing in this book, basically reading this book, which is 1,000 uh, pages, but only half is um, his uh, uh, contributions, the other are selected papers uh, by him, you find everything. I mean, I could not find nothing more uh, published in nature, in science, published papers than what is here, from the point of view at least of physics and engineering. Small contributions, uh, other stuff, but not a, for instance, here is optical levitation, what you see. It's a particle which stays in a capillary and it is shaped by a piezoelec uh, piezoelectric uh, ceramic to allow it to go up because otherwise the adhesion forces are too high for the laser to detach them. And once the particle is detached, the laser keeps it levitated. And what you see, it is not the real size of the particle, but is uh, the scattering from the particle. It's like with the stars that we see. We do not see the real size of them, but the scattering. So it's, it's a larger size, because this particle is 50 micrometer. You cannot see with uh, your eyes, and you cannot uh, record on, uh, with, with a photographic camera. But this is an image with a photographic camera. OK. so. Stephen Chu so received, and the other two, received the Nobel Prize in 97 for development of methods to cool and trap atoms with laser light. Stephen Chu actually worked in, in the group uh, of Ashkin. And uh, then uh, he moved to Stanford. And uh, well, now he is a minister of uh, energy in the United States, in the Obama. Obama. No, he's a fantastic manager, but, and also a scientist. But uh, he's, he's still, so is one Nobel Prize, is another Nobel Prize in 2002, based on optical trapping, on the ideas and work of Ashkin. And that in 2002 in physics is uh, Bose-Einstein condensation. And Ashkin uh, already says that will be probably three. And the third is expected from applications in biology. So it's uh, in single molecule uh, force spectroscopy. OK, just a, a bit of, um, of history. Then, some properties of optical tweezers. What type of particles can be trapped as material? Dielectric, usually we play with beads of silica or polystyrene. Also metallic particles with some conditions is not so simple. And here I forgot uh, something in between, which is very important, quantum dots. Gold, silver, copper, biological cells, macromolecules, intracellular structures, DNA, filaments. Low index, by low index we mean, uh, for instance, the bubbles which are used in echography to enhance the contrast. So bubbles filled with gas. The gas has a refractive index lower than the liquid in which they are immersed. By this we mean low index. Also crystal or amorphous uh, size. Also the size uh, here has a, wide, uh, has a wide range, actually, 20 nanometer to 20 micrometer. As shape, spherical, cylindrical, arbitrary. B basically, we, we, we could trap everything. The range of forces is more or less this. I say more or less because it, you, you can go also to 200, uh, 500 piconewton and also to fractions to 10 femtonewton. Uh, uh, but uh, this is the most used. So just to, to have an idea, you know, one piconewton is a gravitational force of a particle with a mass of 0.1 nanogram. So very small forces we, we are uh, with. Here is an example of a setup um, for optical manipulation. So this one is based on an inverted microscope where you have the petri dish, you have the cells, you have the objective, you have the bright field in yellow, no, imaging. 
Um, and then you have also the fluorescence using uh, the mercury lamp or other uh, or confocal, so using lasers. And uh, then we add here the infrared laser for trapping, infrared because in this way we do not uh, damage the samples, and the UV laser which is used for ablation. So everything is around, and in our case is a Nikon uh, inverted microscope, but doesn't matter, it can be another. Actually we have three setups available, the other two are custom, that is, uh, we built the microscope, so they are more flexible for us to change that. And one is also available as a neurobiology sector in CISA, Professor Torre. Um, okay, so now what about local stimulation and probing in single cell experiments? Uh, I took this picture from uh, a review in trends in uh, cell biology done by uh, Heidemann and Wirtz. <coughs> Uh, both are biologists, so I, I liked it uh, very much because they picture the situation like this. You have the cell, and then you have tools. You have tools like atomic force microscopy now to probe the surface of the cell, to probe mechanical properties, to probe um, among them adhesion or viscoelasticity and so on. But you have also optical tweezers uh, which uh, in another range of forces, in another regime can do the same thing. Then you can apply magnetic field, so you can you have magnetic tweezers, which can invest can be used to investigate uh, uh, the propor properties, uh, the membrane properties, and the cell surface properties. Then you can insert nanoparticles inside the cell in the cytoskeleton and follow simply the uh, tracking the particles, and that tracking tells you about the uh, uh, viscoelastic properties of the cytoskeleton. So it gives you information about that. So is what is called nanoreology. Then you, one can use microcarriers, carriers um, with, uh, filled with uh, different molecules, uh, which can be released to the cell. No, in uh, the nearby of the cell and so on. In fact, we will speak in this presentation about these two situations. No. So here, I will switch off for a moment the light, if I am not wrong, is this one, because it's the only movie with bad contrast. Here, we have a HeLa cell adhered on the surface, and the cage of seven beads which stay on a surface like this. And then we move the HeLa cell, so we move the substrate under the cage. The idea is once the cell is under the cage, we can approach the beads as you see. You see? We approach the beads on the cell and we can stimulate mechanically, for instance, the cell. How we build the cage? We build a cage using a um, spatial light modulator and the technique uh, based on diffractive optical elements. I do not enter into details. The idea is that with this, so the spatial light modulator is like the uh, spatial light modulator in the video projector. So we send the signal to the uh, video projector, let us say, and we read it with laser. And the laser beam is shaped in such a way to form instead of one trap, seven traps in this case, and seven traps disposed in different planes, in three planes. You see also here, and you see them unfocused because they are in different planes, okay? And once you do this, you can move them dynamically. So move dynamically, of course, it's, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> it's plonus, but, uh, um, you can move them with uh, quite a high frequency. Okay, so and then what you can do with the beads, you can functionalize them. For instance, you can functionalize them with fibronectin to f favorize you know, the uh, adhesion or the interaction with integrin and then to 
apply forces now to see how the cell answers to the force applied by the bead coated with fib fibronectin. In this uh, example, in this experiment, we uh, worked with three beads and we modulated the force to see how much the difference of uh, the force applied is perceived by, by the cell and how. For this, we used the uh, Vinculin uh, GFP transfective HeLa cell. And um, the, this is the image, the DIC image with the three beads. And the forces are indicated by the intensity of the laser, no? which keeps these beads. You increase the intensity, you increase the force applied on, on the cell, you increase the strength. So then in fluorescence, we see that after 20 minutes, we have a picture like this, which in detail is this, which shows that the intensity, the fluorescence intensity is higher where the force applied was higher. What does this mean? That the vinculin accumulated more there, so the cell answered to that specific focal adhesion point with um, accumulating with a higher rigidity because vinculin binds now the actin. So the actin, more actin is moving at that focal adhesion point be, to answer to a higher force. This is a smaller force and the, uh, the smallest. Okay, so we can play quite a lot with, uh, just to show with uh, the dynamicity. This uh, guy did the past, uh, master with us and he played with his name like this, Bids, writing Paolo, no? It's just a game. But this can be also implemented in, in uh, with cells. For instance, with uh, uh, E. coli, we build uh, an array of uh, cells, three by three, and look here, we change the position of these two. Huh? So we can, we can play quite a lot. An example that I like is not ours, is from MIT, is a permanent assembly of living cell in 3D microarrays. So in this case, they surrounded the cell in green with uh, bacteria, with 15 bacteria. And this you can do with multiple tweezers, okay? But the problem is in, then that uh, the biologue wants to keep this configuration for two days, you know, to see which is the effect of the bacteria on, on, on the cell. And uh, to do this, they use a photopoly, uh, photopolymerizable hydro hydrogel, no? which exposed to UV for very short exposure, freeze the configuration, keeping the cells alive. And then you put them in incubator and follow uh, the experiment for, for, um, for, from the biological point of view. Here is a, a still an, another example where uh, this group studied the cell-cell interaction. So they have a Jurkat uh, uh, cell surrounded by uninfected primary CD4 cells. They are in red, the CD4 plus T cells, and the uh, Jurkat in green. <coughs> and this configuration is op uh, obtained by using optical manipulation. And then you can use fast confocal fluorescent microscopy to understand what happens at the interface. So you put with optical manipulation in condition the cells, in condition that you want to, to, to be in contact, and then you can uh, follow uh, the synapses as they form. Uh, I mean, that part is more your part, biological part, <laughs> how to say. Um, so there are some advantages on this. Manipulating cells, so imagine that you have these two cells and they are in contact, but if you make confocal microscopy, you want to read a different planes and then you have to reconstruct the 3D. It's not so nice and easy. But what if you rotate the cells, so you put the cell, this cell on top of the other, and then you have the plane that you are interested in to study. Probably the movie 
gives you an idea. No? Then, because this is the plane of, or the axis of, uh, of the microscope, so you can see directly the surface in one, one shot, which is pretty uh, important. Another application um, is applying forces. So this is a bead, and uh, the force is applied in this direction with a laser. And uh, this uh, group, in this paper, they report an SRC reporter, um, which enables uh, to, to, to image uh, the activation of SRC when you apply forces on the membrane. And um, oh, I, I think it is uh, a great, uh, great work. I, here should be also a movie. I, I should run it like this. So you, you see that SRC is activated far from the force immediately. And then there is a wave propagation of SRC activation toward the place of the, uh, the force. Then you for sure know much more than me uh, the role that SRC plays on uh, uh, regulating the integrin, uh, integrin and actin, um, how to say, binding and, uh, and work. So the idea is you have a cell. The cell is plated in this case on uh, fibronectin. And uh, you have a bit, because usually when you have the cell plated, uh, if you look at the interactions with the uh, extracellular matrix on the top of the cell, is, is not really the point, no? Because you should look at the surface where you have uh, mimic, uh, you mimic better the situation. Uh, here the propose is to understand how much the interaction between fibronectin and uh, uh, integrin influences the adhesion between the cell and the bead, which mimics a cell, because the, BB, uh, the bead is covered with is coated with uh, uh, cadherins. Okay, so what they do, they they plate the cells on um, surfaces with different areas. So they modulate the surface of fibronectin plated areas. And then they put in contact the bead and measure the local rigidity no? to express how the adhesion between the bead and the cell surface. So the, uh, between cadering and cadering. Uh, the results are, are pretty significant. Uh, here you see uh, how much the rigidity increases with time, incubation time, for different surfaces areas. And the result is clear. If you have a small surface on which you plate the cell, you know, 150 micron is something like... Uh, 10 by 10, something more. more. So it's the cell, fibronectin, and that's all. Then it is. And you see that the adhesion is characterized by a rigidity, high rigidity. Then if you increase the area, this is reduced. And if you plate basically the cells, now coating all the surface with fibronectin, the rigidity characterizing the adhesion, cell-cell adhesion, decreases uh, a lot. Uh, this is an example from uh, our lab uh, in collaboration with uh, CISA. We used beads trapped in front of lamellopodia and philopodia of the gross cone of neurons to measure the forces expressed by uh, gross cone when uh, is looking around, when is searching uh, the, the cues and uh, searching at the end the, the other neurons to connect with. So the idea is that we place these beads here and then we measure the fluctuations of the beads before they are touched by philopodia and lamellopodia and after. 
And in this way, we measure the forces expressed by this. Here are some examples for lamellopodia. It's, you see the lamellopodia and goes after, and is so strong that it takes out the bit from the trap. And here is the philopod. Uh, the philopodia is a bit too much accelerated, this is two minutes event. But the, the idea, I think it is clear. Another application is to measure locally visco viscoelastic <coughs> properties by extracting, by pulling tethers from the cell membrane. So the idea is to uh, approach a bit to the cell, then move the stage, obtain, extract a tether, and while you extract the tether, you measure the length of the tether, and you measure the displacement of the bead, that is the force. And then you obtain a curve like this. So you have an elastic region, then you have a maximum force, presumably is when the membrane detaches from the cytoskeleton, the, the tether, and then a viscose regime, when the, the tether gets longer without having any elastic Op um, opposition, let us say. Here you see the bead. This is, uh, I think, is MDA, MDA breast cancer cell. And you see how the tether is obtained. The tether is so thin that you do not see. But when you, we arrive at the end, we switch off the laser, and we see that the bead goes back to the cell, which means that it, it is something which uh, brings it there. So is this, this is a way we check that we have a tether, because otherwise we do not see it. So we did this experiment in uh, collaboration with uh, um, the group of uh, Giorgio Stanta and uh, Serena Bonin from Catinara, from the university. And we uh, analyzed different type of cell lines. These cell lines, this is the most aggressive from the point of view of uh, metastasis. And the idea is that uh, the cells more um, aggressive uh, are, more uh, softer they are. And this you can see now from the black curve here, the slope is smaller than for the blue and for the red. And this is, th these are mean values. Actually, these are the values here. So is an indicator of uh, the viscoelasticity of, of the cells. Of course, we, at the beginning, I thought that this can be applied for diagnosis. I can tell now, no, absolutely no, because it's very difficult to measure uh, them. And to have a good number, is, uh, it, it takes uh, this. But it can be good to understand the mechanism uh, behind uh, this behavior. And that might be helpful. So focal cell bio biochemical stimulation using optically manipulated microvectors, the cell part. So the typical situation of the experiments in, uh, in biology, if I am not wrong, in cell biology is this. You have a Petri dish, which is 30 millimeters, but let us say 10 millimeters, you have the cells 10 micrometers or so. You have um, then, if you want to change the environment, you introduce molecules by pipetting soluble uh, uh, molecules, no? and you wait for them to diffuse no? and uh, to reach the cells. And then maybe you can optically stimulate them, for instance, uncaging. No? You can also electrical or magnetic stimula stimulating them, and then you, you want to observe them. So the idea is anyway that you apply, you introduce the molecules, and you wait for them to diffuse. And then you choose one or another cell which you say, OK, this is good. I think here, they are, uh, among these, there is also another disadvantage. Uh, in biology, uh, I learned that uh, gradients are very important. Gradients in the sense that uh, if you have a cell and you apply a constant 
Uh, so you introduce molecules with a constant distribution of, in, in terms of concentration. The behavior of the cell is different from when you introduce molecules with spatial gradients or with temporal gradients. At least for, for neuronal cells, this is fundamental. OK, so we discussed three examples. One, functionalized beads, one, biodegradable polymers, and one, the third one, the filled liposomes. So how, before this, how we manipulate the vectors? So we, we uh, the molecules, we put them somehow, we attach them to the vectors. Then we have to bring the vectors from a capillary, from a reservoir with optical tweezers to the cell. And then we deliver them by contact. Maybe it is enough that the molecules which are on the surface of the bead get in contact with the membrane. Or in the case of liposomes, we break the membrane and we deliver the molecules. Why local delivery stimulation? Well, it's clear that they are very good for selected cell experiments. In this case, I select the cell I want to work, not like in bulk stimulation where I go to the cell which is better after bulk stimulation. Uh, sorry. Um, different compartments of the cell can have different behaviors under the same stimulus. And this is the, at least the case of neurons. We can scale down, we will see, we can scale down the number of molecules that are used. So we can begin to understand how many molecules are necessary for a certain type of stimulation. We can stimulate different compartments of the cell with different molecules because we can have vectors, different vectors with different molecules, and we can ma manipulate them. So for instance, a chemoattractant and a chemorepellent. We have a high spatial and temporal resolution, and of course, it is, uh, the discussion is open. Uh, we use mainly uh, beads coated with a carboxylic group because we can attach any kind of protein on, on it. And as an example, I, I show the stimulation. So, so um, the stimulation of uh, hippocampal neurons with uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, um, which is uh, deposited on the surface of, uh, of beads. This work was done by uh, Elisa Deste during the PhD. Uh, she, I think, is one, no, no, one of the first, but the second. At the moment, anyway, at the moment in my group, I was the only engineer, and the other was were all biologists, which was very good for me because I could learn a lot, but it was also very difficult because I had to go very, very often to the lab to fix laser, to fix that and that and that in the computer. But anyway, uh, with Elisa was a successful uh, experience. So how uh, the experiment layout is like this. We have two capillaries with two type of beads. One coated with BSA, used as control, and the second with BDNF. So we first apply the BSA bead and check that nothing happens is a control. Then we apply the BDNF bead, we see the effect, and then we have to, to cancel uh, the hypothesis that the effect is induced by mechanical coupling between the beads, we use BSA bead and BSA bead. What we, we look for? We look for um, the triggering of uh, uh, track B uh, pathway. And we uh, look with, uh, mainly at the calcium increase induced by local BDNF stimulation and other two elements, as I show here. So we show that um, uh, we, we, we could show the phosphorylation of the track B, so showing that the bead indeed induces uh, the, the activates the track B receptor. We showed also that uh, we induced with a single bead the C-force translocation into nucleus, 
And also what we see, we see that the neurons, the growth cones are uh, stimulated or the, dendri the growth cone and dendrite are stimulated when touched with BDNF coated beads. So this is a calcium imaging. So the uh, flow of the experiment is like this. This is a DIC image, the, uh, the soma. This is a dendrite on which we place a bead and we follow for 10 minutes the calcium and we see that it is constant. Then we apply the BDNF bead and we follow for 40 minutes and we see that we have an increase, a, con a consistent increase um, of calcium in uh, soma and also in the dendrite where we applied the BDNF bead. Of course, we did a lot of experiments, statistics uh, to confirm this. And the, uh, this is one of the papers that I like the most. It was published in Integrative Biology, not bad, but uh, I think it could be better. But anyway, it's a good paper. If you want to read, I, <laughs> I can say that it's a good paper. Uh, then phosphorylation. Now, here you have the situation in bulk. And in green, you see the phalloidin. In red, you see the uh, phosphorylation of track B. Uh, untreated, we do not have any phosphorylation. Uh, treated with BDNF in bulk, we have phosphorylation. Then with BSA, we do not have phosphor BSA bead, I mean, is this one. And this is, uh, this is a detail. We do not have phosphorylation. While with BDNF bead, we see under it a lot of red, so a lot of phosphorylation, which means track B was activated. Okay. Um, this is a, a CFOS nuclear translocation. The same here is BSA, and here is a BDNF bead, and then different uh, tests uh, with inhibitor, and uh, just to, to be sure that everything is checked. And here is a gross cone and the bead with BSA, and you see that the gross cone sees his way, is not caring too much about the bead. Instead here, we have the bead, and you see that gross cone goes under the bead and is pretty dynamic. It's difficult to quantize this, but from the qualitative point of view, the difference is clear. Well, here, we are trying to move the project on, and my dream would be to go toward really to see very well, which means super resolution. And Elisa is now working in Göttingen with Stefan Helf, who is known for uh, STED microscopy. And these are results about uh, uh, showing the growth cone, the tubulin and actin imaging in growth cones, is an example, and in confront with a confocal. So I don't think that I have to comment the, the difference. Uh, here we take the details and we evaluated which is the, the, the resolution that we can obtain is 34, 35, let us say, nanometer. It's not bad, no? Uh, and also 75 nanometer. So my message would be also, uh, if possible in next future, not forget about confocal, but invest in, in super resolution. Instead, or uh, now they are uh, photoswitchable proteins, and uh, uh, this uh, give a better advantage because you can go real time, because they need uh, lower power, because here, the, the gain in, in uh, resolution is given by the ratio between the stead laser and the excitation laser. So you need to increase, enhance the resolution, you need to send a lot of power. And it's not good for, for time, uh, timing and also for the samples. Anyway, uh, now they moved on, on uh, this is, these are fixed samples, but they moved on real time measurements living cell measurements. So what we learned is uh, simple that with a single bead is enough to activate biological pathways in neurons. What was nice was that we could show that 
BDNF do not necessarily need to be endocyted to trigger the receptor since the molecules are covalently cross-linked to the bead surface. This was by chance, but was good because uh, it was a debate in biology if it is necessarily the, the um, BDNF should go into the cell to trigger or not. And the answer is uh, no, not necessarily. Okay, we want also to see how, what happens if the molecules are released, not stay on the surface. So this example, we are working now on this. I will show some nice results that are not ours. So the idea is this, what I said with the molecular gradients and um, they are very important. And fortunately now they are bio biodegradable polymer microsources the same material that is used for the pills, for the in pharma, pharmacology, no? That we take that they are biodegradable. The only thing is that they are smaller and they incorporate molecules in, in no, in, in the same way, but a smaller number of molecules. In this example, I, uh, uh, I show um, PLGA is used and uh, two uh, molecules, a chemoattractant and a chemorepellent. It's a Nature Methods paper. Uh, they were very, very smart choosing the right cells because we were working in the same time, but we had difficulties because we were working with neurons, with cells which or answer very fast or are very sensitive or answer very uh, slow. And, and they, they found a good one. So the situation is like this. is a bead. Here is a leading edge of the cell. And these are the molecules you released. And you see the spatial gradient. No? And the results, I think, for the chemoattractant loaded particle are very nice. It's a neutrophil. Look. And look at the time. So the cell follows the bead, which is moved with the laser tweezers. The bead releases molecules and say pew, 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 pew. And here is the repellent, two beads, you see, they are positioned, and the cell is forced to pass through because the molecules, the repellent molecules are. Uh, now we are working with, um, with PLGA, and we got preliminary results. Uh, Incorpor uh, englobating um, uh, glucosium, and we try to deliver to cancer cells and uh, to, to see, to study the metabolism uh, of, of cancer cells. But I, I hope we will have some good results. Uh, so, this is what we learned from this type of. Now, on liposomes. Liposomes, fi field liposomes, uh, is a I think uh, a numerical example can give the idea better. Because if we consider a one nanomolar concentration in a liposome of one micron diameter, in average, we have one molecule. So in principle, we can make experiments, stimulation with single molecule of, of the cell. It's not simple, but it is possible because one micron is ideal for, for optics. You can see, you can move. Uh, one nanomolar is not so much for, uh, so low as concentration. So we now work mainly with micromolar, micromolar. So how uh, the liposomes uh, are spherical vesicles of phospholipid bilayer membrane of this size, I know that I learned that they are called vesicles, liposomes, giant liposomes, and so on and so far. Important thing is to understand what uh, they are for us. Probably they are giant vesicles because we use two, five micrometer. Liposomes we call, or people call, when they are 100 nanometers, those used very much in medicine now to, um, for, for drug delivery, for, for instance. So you can place the molecules if they are hydrophilic inside, or if they are lipophilic, you can place the molecules in the membrane. So there are different possibilities. We uh, use a very simple method, lipid films hydration. 
So we deposit the lipid film, we hydrate with aqueous phase, and then we uh, purify with glucose gradients. This is a bright field image of a liposome, big liposome, because it's 10 micron at least diameter. And here is the fluorescence, the confocal, showing the fluorescein inside, no? because we, were, um, we wanted to see if the liposome keeps uh, the, the, the molecules. Uh, the fluorescein <coughs> is pretty small molecule. So this is simple. Uh, you can encapsulate a, a large spectrum of molecules. Is low cost. The first example, or the technique validation, uh, we um, we use the um, potassium chloride. So we encapsulate potassium chloride and we uh, uh, placed the liposome near the cells, and we delivered. And then we followed by calcium imaging the depolarization and calcium influx. The images are not very nice, but they, they are good. We were in a period of having problems with contaminations. OK, so now if we think about this situation, gross cons flirt, and I think the movie is better, shows you what happens. So each neuron sends signals to the other neuron. No? And uh, then they interpret the signals, and it might decide to touch, to create synapses, to like, to not to like, and so on. Like two, two persons, for instance. Uh, the idea is to mimic one of the neurons no, with a vector where you place one type of molecule to see which is Z, the effect of Z type of molecule. And uh, yeah, this is a situation, so I say it's a recent, okay, I say that for localized sources of grid and skews, or you use a micro pipette based assay, no, for turning, and you release like this, or you use optical uncaging. This is a recent uh, review in the uh, Journal of Neuroscience, and we are happy that we were cited and also this method is included uh, now. So the photolysis of neuron. So we have the vector, the liposome, with the molecules inside. We trap, we break the membrane, and we release the molecules to the neuron. So the situation is this, more or less. The question is, which is the concentration at different points here on the cell, the concentration of the molecules, as a function of distance, and that's a, as a function of time. And this can be calibrated, and you have a, an expression like this. And here you see the variation in time for different distances. This is shorter distance. This is larger distances. So they are, for instance, in time is a strong gradient. And this is amazing, because uh, we realize for some experiments that we obtain results more or less the same from the point of view of morphology with a concentration here much lower than nanomolar when it gets constant. And this can be due only to, to the gradient, the strong gradient in, in signaling at the beginning. OK, so uh, with a group of uh, Prof. Torre from SINSA, we tested uh, Netrin-1 and semaphorin-3A. Netrin-1 has a dual um, role, attractant or repellent, while semaphorin is only repellent. And the idea was as, as, uh, was as I show. So here we have the liposome. In green is before photolysis. In red is after photolysis. And in this case, it is a chemoattractant. To check that we have the receptor for chemoattractant, then we fix the sample and we look in uh, immunofluorescence. So the, the movie is also here. So you see the photolysis when the membrane is broken. And then the last frame is this. Uh, then for semaphorin, the same. And we see 
that the growth cones are repealed from, from the source, and is this. And the conclusion, main conclusion uh, is in the scientific reports uh, paper, is that less than five metrin molecules reaching the growth cone it can initiate attraction, while more than 200 semaphorin 3A molecules are necessary for repulsion. So is, to our knowledge, it's the first time when some numbers are given about uh, the effect of these molecules, not only that they, the qualitative approach. Uh, ongoing project, uh, another ongoing project with uh, CISA is with uh, Professor Lemiame from Prion Lab. Uh, so we encapsulate PRPC. PRPCs and truncated PRPCs, and we play with knockout. Huh? And we have pretty nice results. Actually, they <coughs> did years ago experiments in bulk, and they saw an effect of PRPC in terms of stimulating the, the growth of the neurons after 48 hours. We see it after 20 minutes and with much lower concentration because of the gradients. Um, and preliminary results by now suggest that uh, PRPC requires uh, physiologically active PRPC on the membrane to exert their function. So PRPC is a receptor of itself kind of preliminary result. We should go on. Another ongoing project is uh, with a group, two groups actually, even if they are from two institutes, but they are one group actually, Claudia Verderio and Roberto Furlan. They are studying uh, microvesicles released by uh, astrocytes and uh, uh, glia cells. Um, and uh, the hypothesis is that they are uh, uh, messengers of, of the disease. So it's quite a new um, topic and a uh, lot of things to understand how they, uh, <coughs> they interact with the cells and even what they contain because it is supposed that they contain uh, mRNA, mRNA, and so on. So by now, we uh, studied the, the addition of microvesicles released by glia cells to the target cell, astrocytes, microglia, and neurons now, and the specific interaction mechanism. It's amazing to see how, okay, microglia, they, they are macrophage, if I'm not wrong, microglia, also. and you see the microvesicles that are uh, captured by the cells going on the, the, the cell and at the moment disappears. It is captured. I think I am a bit, uh, but I arrived almost at the end. So I presented I, a bit uh, what is optical manipulation, uh, what we can do in terms of local stimulation and probing in single cell experiments, and then uh, part of uh, our work on focal cell biochemical stimulation. This is uh, the group now, Giulietta, who was the main player for the netrin uh, semaphorin vapor. Lodan is running the experiments with uh, PRPC. Uh, Giovanna and Leonardo, they are mainly working on cancer cells. Fatou and Muhammad, uh, also, but they are just new entries, um, so they are more technical. And Federico is uh, studying uh, a fret, so he, fret, uh, fret and, uh, sorry, uh, SRC, so stimulation, but we try to enhance imaging. This is the uh, idea. Um, no acknowledgements go to CNR Yom, underlined, means that there are no more in our group. They left. Göttingen, uh, Cambridge, San Diego. This is here, Friuli, and uh, Dresda. Uh, CISA, uh, Universita University of Trieste, Prof. Don Giorgi and Gabriele Bai, Serena Bonin, and, okay, Giorgio, um, 
Stanta, I forgot one, and from San Raffaele and University of Milan. And that's all. Thank you. For